I was doing some light reading recently and discovered a Windows 95 feature I had never heard of. Server-based setup. Server-based setup lets an administrator install a shared copy of Windows 95 on a network share and then remotely boot many clients over the network off of a floppy disk, even if the computer doesn't have a hard drive. It's a finicky, underdocumented, and error-prone feature, so unfortunately we're only going to get painfully close to actually booting remotely via that floppy. But we'll successfully install shared versions of Windows 95 over the network, learn how to set up Windows 95 VMs in 86 box, and if I'm being honest, have a pretty fun time revisiting Windows 95 throughout the video. Let's get into it. I went to the thrift store with my wife the other day and I came across this, the Microsoft Windows 95 Resource Kit. Specifically, it says it's the technical guide to planning for, installing, configuring, and supporting Windows 95 in your organization. It was also $4.99 and pink tags were half off, $2.50. Can't beat that. What piqued my interest, other than its stunning good looks, is that it's not one of these books about the Win32 API or development or for developers. A lot of these old big Windows books you're gonna find on eBay or thrift stores or in the background of random YouTube videos are programming oriented. Their focus is on the developer. This is programming Windows 5th edition, the quintessential edition, in my opinion. Though I suppose this edition might be more appropriate for our Windows 95 discussion today. Quick aside on Windows and the Win32 API. A lot of you might be wondering, you know, if you're a Linux or an Apple person, why do people love Windows so much? Why do people keep using Windows? Well, up until arguably relatively recently, for the vast majority of Windows life, Microsoft took backwards compatibility incredibly seriously. For example, this programming Windows 5th edition here, I think the first version of this edition came out in 1999 and it was subsequently updated for Windows XP. But the point is it's 25 years old and in 2020, I decided I was gonna plow through every chapter of this. Looks like I got about that far. Made it all the way to basic drawing. Anyway, I was able to install Microsoft Visual C++ 6, use the examples from the book and run them on my Windows 10 machine. Many, many, many years later. This is how serious Microsoft used to, or still more or less does, takes backwards compatibility compared to other mainstream OSs. So that's what fascinates me about some of this older stuff. You get to kind of a glimpse into what Microsoft was thinking and what the world was like. Now this one is interesting because it's talking about being an IT administrator rolling this out in your organization. In fact, chapter one is, you know, deciding on the configuration of Windows 95 you want, planning and conducting a pilot rollout and how to get stakeholders behind you and time estimates for how long something like this should take you. The information in this book represents peer IT administration, a corner of the IT and software world that kind of goes unnoticed, at least when it's being done correctly, and without a lot of appreciation. I was reading through figuring there'd be, you know, something I hadn't heard of before, and sure enough, a big one. Chapter four, server-based setup for Windows 95. If I'm understanding what I'm reading, you can have Windows 95 installations per client on a server, and you can either start them up with a hard disk, start them up off a of floppy, or entirely remote somehow. This sounds a whole lot like thin client Windows 95 to me. Supposedly some Windows 95 installers have a net setup tool that lets you set all this up on one Windows 95 machine acting as a server, you can host a Windows 95 installation per client that you're gonna have on a file share, and then theoretically boot with just a floppy into your Windows 95 environment, which is pretty impressive. Windows 95 has been on my mind. It was the first OS I used to get on the internet. And recently down here, I set up some Cisco equipment that actually lets me dial up with physical modems over telephone lines. And these babies were also at the thrift store at the same time I found this one. And if that dial-up situation coupled with this combo isn't the universe telling me to worry about Windows 95, I don't know what it is. Now, one problem with running Windows 95 is hardware. It's pretty constrained out of the box. It's got a maximum CPU speed at once, memory size, hard drive size, and I don't have any mid-90s PCs. I've got a couple of these old early 2000s laptops. This is an Intel M, this is an Athlon. There are fixes you can apply to your Windows 95 installation to let it run on more modern hardware. The biggest problem with these laptops though is they, uh, 
don't work. So I think what we're going to try at first is the virtualization route for the Windows 95 installations, both the server and the one we're going to try to boot off of just a floppy. And virtualization of Windows 95 is no easier than hunting down the hardware, so should be a fun ride. But I wouldn't do you dirty with just some virtualization stuff. This is a pretty good excuse to fire up this thing, a compact ProLiant Gen 1 DL380 from 2000. He turned 24 this year. It's got two Pentium 3s, which is pretty sweet. It's running Windows 2000, which I think should work as our file share to store the remote Windows 95 installs on. There are a handful of ways to get Windows 95 emulated. One is called PCM, and another, which we'll predominantly be using, is called 86box. You can even get it running in VirtualBox by installing the patch I mentioned earlier to let it run on more modern hardware, but really, I would recommend the other two. Just to give you a little sneak peek. So good. I've successfully installed Windows 95 on all three emulators, but in the end, 86box works for me best because I was able to get networking set up. Maybe you can in the other two. I have a very specific requirement where I need to get these VMs on my local area network because I want them talking to each other. By default in 86box and PCM, you're only gonna have access to the Slurp protocol. Long story short, this lets you get the VM on the internet, but it can't talk to your network. What we want is PCAP. PCEM supports this as well. This is the 86 box documentation. I couldn't get it working, so here we are. I'm doing this on a Windows 11 machine, so this is gonna be a Windows tutorial. I'm sorry, I'm focusing on Windows today. First thing you're gonna to wanna to do is install MPCAP. You can just Google this. And of course, you'll need to install 86 box. There's plenty of documentation online about how to do this. It's a little involved, you need to get some ROMs. Their documentation shows you exactly what you need to do. We are going to add a new machine. I'm gonna call this win95serve. So this is gonna be our setup server. Let's say configure this virtual machine now. I'll breeze through this pretty quickly because A, it's boring, and it's a culmination of a bunch of other stuff I found online. There's plenty of resources for this. I'm hoping to pique your interest and uh, maybe this will fill the gaps for you if you're having trouble. For the machine type, I used a 46 socket three, and all these settings you're seeing are not scientific. They are just what I found to work and what I saw in some tutorials. We are gonna go with this Asus mainboard in AMD 486DX4. We'll max it out at 120 megahertz. Let's do 32 megabytes of RAM. That will be more than enough for Windows 95. Over in display, we're gonna go with this Cirrus Logic Diamond Speedstar Pro video card. Input devices, we need to make sure we have a mouse. I just use standard PS2 mouse, seems to work fine. For sound, we can throw a Sound Blaster on there. I don't know about Sound Blaster 16. Now network, I need to pass through my network. We installed MPCAP for this very reason because if you don't do that, you're only gonna have none and slurp here. So we want PCAP. I don't think you can pass through a WAN interface. Don't quote me on that. This is my ethernet interface on the host machine and we are gonna use a Novell NE2000. Sometimes you'll be doing these tutorials and you can't get the network card to working and it's gonna be some IRQ conflicts. I'm gonna leave this default for now and we'll probably have to go fix it and I'll show you how to do that. We'll leave all the serial port and parallel port stuff default for now related to our IRQs I was describing. Storage, so we'll just use the internal hard drive controller for this particular motherboard and then we need to add a hard disk. Let's do a one gigabyte drive, that should be more than enough. People like to use uh, these VHD files because I think you can mount them and put files on them, but I haven't found it to uh, be a big deal for me. And it's done and it's reminding us to partition and format, which can really throw you off if you haven't installed older versions of Windows before, we'll go through all that. We want some three and a half floppies and I think that's it, so we'll say okay. Now let's talk about Windows 95 install media. WinWorld PC is a great resource to get these older Windows versions. And for Windows 95, you're gonna hear this OSR 1, OSR 2.5 thrown around. It stands for OEM Service Release. Windows 95 had a few major releases throughout its life. So 
I think OSR 2.1 brought USB support. OSR 2 was a big one, FAT32 support. You could support, I think, drives bigger than two gigabytes. OSR 2.5 really changed the look and feel. I think it shipped with Internet Explorer 4 by default. Anyway, I would recommend, you know, OSR 2 and up. Uh, you can go older than that if, you, if you're looking for what it was like to use earlier versions of Windows 95. But for kicking the tires, you know, I'll probably use OSR 2.5. And you're going to need a boot disk. So most Windows 95 CD installations, as it says right here, are not bootable. You need a floppy disk to format your drive with, load CD-ROM drivers, and boot into the OS. Well, let's start up our fresh machine here. And we can see we are seeing the faithful recreation of the BIOS. The BIOS, actually, it's the real ROMs. The cool thing about 86box and PCM is it's as if we're sitting in front of this 486. In fact, the ROMs I was talking about earlier and the ones you'll see in the documentation, this is the BIOS that was on this main board we chose, which is pretty cool. I'm not seeing anything in here that's bugging me, so let's get out. And of course, it doesn't know what to do. There's no floppy, there's no OS installed. So the first thing we're gonna do is load up our floppy drive with a Windows 95 boot disk. Now they're not all created equal. Some of them don't have floppy drivers but there's a million of them online, you'll find, a, you'll find a good one. So we're rebooting here, starting Windows 95, and here we go. This is a nice uh, boot disk because I can jump right in with CD-ROM support, loading a CD-ROM driver. No drives found. Did I forget to add a CD-ROM? I did forget to add a CD-ROM drive, that's kind of important. A tappy, uh, you could put 8X or whatever low speed you want if you want the OG experience. I'll just do 24, that feels right. Okay, I haven't put a CD in. This is still just the floppy boot disk. We'll do normal, and we'll start with CD-ROM boot support just like last time. Right away, you are confronted with complaints and that option three says some viruses can cause your C drive not to register. <laughs> Don't worry, we just have an unpartitioned, unformatted drive. We'll let this load and I'll show you what to do. Imagine doing this without the internet. You just had whatever booklet came with it, or your buddy's dad came over to help. <laughs> So now we're at the A prompt. First thing we need to do with this brand new disk is FDisk. This is gonna set up our partition tables. I have a disk larger than 512 megabytes, so we want to enable large disk support. All the defaults through here are fine to create a primary DOS partition. It happens pretty quick and then says you need to restart. And I think my BIOS is trying to boot from the hard drive now because it can see it properly. Uh, we need to go back into the BIOS settings. It's all emulated, but boy, does it feel like you're really here doing it. And it's so fast I can't get in. Got it. Standard, I think we need to find, aha. So boot sequence, it's trying to boot from the C drive, like I was saying, and it can kind of find it now because it's partitioned uh, and that's not gonna work. So we press page up to say boot from the floppy first, which is usually what you want anyway when you're messing around. So we're back at the A prompt. This is still the boot disk. We're going to format the C drive. Some of, you just do format C. Some of the CDs actually have a nice little wizard like you might expect from a more modern installation. But I'm doing it this way just so you can see what it's like. It's kind of more fun anyway. I always just give it a label of C. So now we are ready to actually get into the setup. So we're gonna go CD-ROM and load this up. I've got an ISO of OSR 2.5, like I was showing you earlier. That should be in drive D. It is. So now I'm on the CD-ROM drive, and I can say setup. It's going to do some checks to make sure our drive is healthy. And it is, so you just go exit. And here we go. Look at that. So not much to say here. I'm going to breeze through it until there's something interesting to do. Let me consult my certificate of authenticity. <laughs> the drum. I always loved that little guy. Which designer thought that was like, that was it? We'll throw the drum on there. Okay, it's ready to restart. It's not done yet. 
Now we will perform the classic song and dance of ejecting all of our media, the boot disk and the CD-ROM, otherwise it will try to boot to those. Finish. And we might see the booting for the first time. Oh, look at that. Getting ready to run Windows for the first time. You don't see this very often. I always used this one as my background for some reason, or a lot of the time anyway. Okay, see if we get some audio. Oh, uh, maybe we don't get that till later. It's grinding away. It kind of implies you need to follow the printer wizard, but just cancel it. We restart again. Oh yeah. Pray for audio. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, well, here we are. The next order of business. So you, you can make your display better and stuff. I'm not going to mess with that. It's so easy to hose your installation and I don't really need it. Maybe I'll touch on it. What we're going to do, control panel, network. You can see by default, uh, we do not have the TCP IP stack. So you go through this and you go Microsoft TCP IP. Maybe I do need to fix my UI. So you got to put your Windows disk back in and it never seems to guess the right drive. I think I'm on D. Pretty much any change you ever make, it wants the Windows install media. It doesn't want to waste precious space on your hard drive um, for stuff you don't need. And we will almost certainly be restarting. Yeah, this like red coloring going on, that's just some funny business with the emulator. That's obviously not what Windows looked like. So let's eject the disk and it's already confused. Let's not restart at the moment. Go take a look at device manager. And if we look at our adapter, you can see it's trying to use IRQ3 uh, and that's never gonna work because by default, one of the serial or parallel ports is using it. So what we're gonna do is go shut this down entirely. And th there's other ways to deal with this, but I mean, we don't need any of these serial or parallel ports. So I'm just getting rid of them we'll start things back up. Okay, this UI is ridiculous. Let me refresh my memory on what to do here. <laughs> Change of plan, watched another tutorial. We're going with the Sang Labs Diamond Stealth 32. How many hours of your life did you waste staring at this screen? Only for it to inevitably fail. That looks better. This tutorial I'm showing on the screen, I'll put a link in the description, is the one you wanna follow, not mine. Back to networking. So, you go start, run and you're going to want to say CMD, you know, nope, doesn't exist yet. Command is what you want. Come in here. You're of course going to say IP config. <laughs> nope. Just kidding. Doesn't exist yet. Win IP config is the one you want. And this means windows thinks the adapter is working. You can see it, but we don't have an IP address. So let's go over to TCP IP properties and let's give it a gateway to get its IP from, which is hopefully my router on my network. Let's try one IP config again. Let's do a renew, I think. Oh, come on. Is this fun to watch? This is what it was like trying to do anything back then. Uh, I still have a problem. I'm conflicting with the COM port that you saw me remove earlier. So I'm gonna try throwing it on this one. I don't think it matters. As long as there's no conflict, we will be restarting, I'm sure. Oh yeah, full shutdown. It works now. I won't subject you to any more troubleshooting. Let Windows control the resource automatically over an 86 box, set the IRQ to three, and bam, 192.168.1216. This is an IP address handed out by my router. Can we ping? We can ping Google from my Windows 95 VM. Now let's figure out what this server setup stuff's all about. The chapter in the book about server-based setup that kicked off this whole adventure mentions in the Windows 95 install disk, there's an admin net tools net setup directory. But if I load up my OSR 2.5 disk, this is what happens, by the way, when you install, when you insert Windows 95 media into a Windows 95 machine, if we take a look in admin net tools, there is no net setup folder, which is kind of weird. 
I have a bunch of these Windows ISOs. So A, B, and C uh, are, I think, 1, 2, and 2.5. They also had A, B, C names. Even A, one of the early releases, OSR1, doesn't have it. And this book is from 1995, so I would have figured it'd be on there. But as luck has it, I have this Windows 95A upgrade CD, and it's on here. Uh, I don't know where I got this ISO. I've had it for years. And if we take a look in here, sure enough, net setup, and we can run the program we saw in the screenshots from the book. So we've got server-based setup. Now, the next hurdle is I need a shared directory. So it wants me to do something like, you know, that compact and then my Win95 serve share or something. We're gonna try using the Windows 2000 machine and it'll be quite the headache, like this computer doesn't have a user, so we'll have to figure out anonymous and <laughs> or, or all the user-based setup. I think it's pretty straightforward, but let's fire up the old space shuttle. Okay, I'm not gonna lie to you. Before I fire up the jet engine, I decided it would make more sense to duplicate the Win95 VM we just set up together and figure out if I could at least get the two of them talking before I fire up some real hardware and waste <laughs> even more time. The very first hurdle, of course, was when I was using the Novell NE2000, they had the same MAC address, so my router was getting confused and they couldn't ping each other because the router thought they were the same machine like coming online at the same time. Windows 95 can understand this Realtek RTL 8019 AS no problem. This is one of the NICs that comes with the basic ROM pack for 86 box. So I switched the duplicate to this and then I finally remembered uh, you can right click Network Neighborhood, it has been so long. Go Properties, and then you can get into the Network Settings, of course. I've changed the name, so same work group, but we're Win95.2, spelled out for some reason. We do a WinIP config over here. We've got a .1.118. Kinda never get tired of hearing that. Totally different IPs, and they can ping each other. They're on the same network. The issue I was fighting, which I remember having when I was a kid, is I could never get Network Neighborhood to do like anything interesting. Always unable to browse network, blah, 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 blah. So I created a folder and I right clicked it. This is on the dupe machine. And I went over to sharing. I shared it as I believe because I was having a lot of faith. I'm saying access type full and then uh, you can't do a very long password. It's like seven or eight characters or something, but I gave it full access, and then if we go into the network properties, it's an important aspect to come into file and print sharing, I think, and at least turn on, I want to be able to give others access to my files. So I did this on both machines. So here I am on the VM we set up together just moments ago, and you can see I have a username. I made the password clab, I think. So I'm logged in, and suddenly, network neighborhood, has a bunch of stuff going on. This cloud box uh, is the host machine I'm on now. Say what you want about Microsoft backwards compatibility and I suppose a lot of this is just the generic network stack. But if I click this, it's of course not gonna work. But the point is, it can see the machine. I got an OS from 1995 being emulated very faithfully, I must admit, hosted by a Windows 11 machine and it, they can see each other. And so this is the machine I'm on and then Win95.2, we were just looking at. I can see, I believe it's here, a text file that I put there that says hi. This other stuff, this is a Windows 10 machine, I think. Then we got a Windows XP machine hosting something I needed for another Windows XP machine. I don't even know what this is. Uh, but they can talk to each other and they're pretty far away too in terms of years. So yeah, a lot of folks that probably know a lot about Windows networking are yelling at me right now, but <laughs> Here's the dupe machine that I copied with the I believe share. Of course, we can make another text document, YouTube. Look at Notepad. This is how I learned to make websites. We'll type some text in there and save it. And of course, if we browse to the share over here, we can see the other text document. So, you know, we're good to go. Now this one still sees nothing. Network neighborhood, unable to browse. The way I solve this, which I might regret when we get to Windows 2000, is I changed everything to Windows Logon, 
like that. And then of course we're gonna have to restart. Look at that, there are one users connected to your computer networking. Now, after a restart, it's saying, identify yourself with a name. If you don't type a password, we won't ask you again. So I can say, I don't know, clab2, I guess, for <laughs> consistency, same password. It asks you to confirm. It's funny, Windows 95 remembers the folders you had open and it remembers the last thing you ran in run, but you cannot press the up arrow on the CLI, you know, to see the last command you ran, which is very indicative of the early Microsoft mindset. At any rate, maybe we're gonna see some stuff here now. Oh, we got the, the flashlights out. She's, we're looking. Yeah, so I needed a username uh, and that's how, what kind of opened up Network Neighborhood. Now I might regret this in Windows 2000, we'll see. I think all you need is a username that matches and the share will work. And obviously I could just use this VM as the share now, but that's not as cool. It was pretty straightforward on the Windows 2000 machine. I created a user with the exact same username and password as my Windows 95 user. I then created a folder name and went over to properties, clicked on sharing and shared it. Over in the security tab before it would work, I had to add the new user I had created. And I actually went ahead and made a couple users to make the next couple steps here a little easier to understand. The Windows 2000 server is all set up. I've got it in another room because it's so loud. We can go on to network neighborhood and on the Windows 95 machine, DL380 is the host name of that compact. And we can see our shares. I made one called Windows 95. This is where the source files for these computers that are booting off the network are gonna go, the actual Windows 95 install. And then there's another one called Machines. This is where you uniquely configure each of your clients that are gonna boot off a of floppy in our case. And of course we can make a folder in there. M1 Machine 1 is gonna be our first attempt here. Heading back over to the install media, we can run net setup. And now I should have a server path, DL380, Win95, before it actually tries to authenticate and make sure it can talk to that or it'll error out right here. Let's do an install. This should copy all the files over. We want our users to have to boot from a server. This all looks good. It has frozen. <laughs> I haven't tried this before. Error initializing for installation. Let's double check we can actually talk to that. DL380, Win95. Yes. Aha, uh -huh. we had a hidden file in here. I didn't think I had tried this. So I had tried it and like canceled out and there was nothing in here <laughs> and it must have laid down this file. I bet if I delete this, it's gonna start working. See what it does this time. Server did not work. Uh, let's restart. Nothing a good restart won't fix. So it's asking me to create default batch scripts. Think we're gonna do this later. We will once again consult the certificate of authenticity. I'm sure most of you know this, but all ones is a valid Windows 95 CD key, in case you were curious. Nice, okay, this is good. We are copying the files from the CD-ROM over to that share folder. I suppose we can probably see it in progress. Load up the Windows 95 share here. Yep, stuff is showing up, excellent. I will come back when this is wrapped up. Excellent, completed successfully. We're about to really get into the thick of the operation here. So up until this point, you might be wondering what extra research online I've been doing outside of this book. And the answer is none. <laughs> I've been pouring over this book like every night for a week until about 30 minutes ago. I did a quick search and sure enough, relatively recently, a YouTuber named The Smoking Cap did a super in-depth series of videos on exactly what we're trying to do here. Netbooting Windows 95. I glanced at the videos a little bit, you know, sort of skimmed through them. And I think I'm even more discouraged than if I had not seen them. <laughs> it's, it's not gonna be easy, but I'm gonna try to stick to this book as much as I can. And those videos will be kind of my fail safe. So I wanted to give credit where credit is due. I already kind of picked up a couple uh, hints, even just during my skimming of the videos. I'll put a link in the description below. They're gonna be way more thorough and better than this one. Now what we're gonna wanna do, I think, is set up a machine. So I'm gonna add a new machine. And remember, I have a machines directory share and we made an M1 folder. 
I think I'll let it generate the setup script. I guess view. Okay, it, it knows we have one. That's good. Over in machines, it's made us this setup script, which I think is making sense. I'm going to consult the book. I think there's some stuff I need to do in here. The server based setup tool has this setup script config builder wizard thing. So I can go in here and decide like, is the user allowed to give any input during the install server based setup? So obviously we want on the server, our boot device is going to be a floppy disk for this setup. So I'm going to go through all this and I'll show you where I end up. It's many hours later, the next day in fact, and this book sucks. At a high level, the way server based setup works is you have a folder on a network share hosting the Windows 95 installation. That's the one we set up with the net setup tool. Then you have another folder on a network share containing folders for each machine you're going to boot over the network. In each machine's folder, there is a config file specifying configuration specific to how it should run setup. And of course, this folder will eventually hold Windows 95 config files specific to it after an install. Back in the shared Windows folder, there is a machines.ini file. You have an entry for each MAC address or unique identifier for the network card for every machine you wish to network boot. This is essentially a manifest of all the machines that are allowed to use this shared installation. All this is fine, this is more or less how you might expect something like this to work, but nowhere in this godforsaken book does it actually tell you how to perform the first boot via floppy and actually get one of these machines set up. All you get is this illuminating example about how you should run setup. How does this thing have access to setup? How do you mount the end drive when booting via floppy? Who the hell is Bob? What is going on? As it turns out, the answer is to install Windows NT4. In Windows NT, you're going to want to run the Network Client Administrator tool, which of course lets you make network installation startup disks. I never would have figured this out without the Smoking Caps videos. I've pretty much given up on the book at this point. I'm using trial and error and his videos. This book makes a lot of big assumptions about your Windows 9X administrative prowess. This tool helps you copy the client's directory from the Windows NT install media. I've already done that. And once you have that, you can put a floppy in, choose Windows 95, which is exactly what I want. And then hopefully you have one of these network adapters on your machine that you're trying to boot from the floppy. I'm gonna use this Etherlink 2. And that's because back over in 86 box, I have a machine that doesn't have a hard drive, but it does have an Etherlink 2 network adapter. Then we can click OK, and you're going to need a boot disk. The Smoking Cap has one on the archive. I'll link it below, and his videos do as well. It's a basic Windows 98 boot disk, and this thing is going to copy network stack files from the NT install media. I think that was the username I used. I am using the TCP IP protocol. We'll give it a default gateway of my router, and we'll say OK. So it's copied it to the disk couple of things to watch out for on the disk. If we open up the config.sys file, it doesn't have high memory drivers. So basically what this means is you're going to put this floppy in and try to start up the networking stack. It's going to run out of memory. So we have to do a few things here. I've got what we need on the clipboard here. So medium story short, you got to do this. Otherwise we're going to run out of memory booting the network stack. And it was really interesting when I chose Etherlink 3 before I realized I didn't have the ROM for that on my machine. It actually produced this for me. So it decides based on the network card if it should use high memory. So just another gotcha in this whole experience. So we'll save those changes and we're going to edit autoexec.bat and it does a bunch of stuff that the other tutorial didn't, but I'm going to leave it because it seems to work. And you can see it's trying to like run some net setup stuff for Windows 95. This tool is meant to have one shared installation of Windows and then run this on machines with hard drives and get that installed to them with all the settings you want and everything. Sort of like Sun's uh, Solaris Jumpstart, if you're familiar. A whole world of pain to uh, explore after we boot Windows 95 on a floppy disk. We don't need this, but what we do need are to mount the Windows 95 and machine directories so that we can use them during setup off this floppy. This one will mount the Windows 95 shared install folder as drive Z, and this one will mount the machines directory, hopefully, as drive X and we can give ourselves a little message when it's done. Here we are on the machine that has no hard drive, as you can see, and no floppy disk inserted in the drive. We are going to load up that floppy disk we just created, starting Windows 98. Like I said, this is a Windows 98 like basic 
boot disk and hi mem what we were talking about before that's good now it's running our autoexec.bat it's going to try to initialize the networking hardware this is saying it found a driver for the 3com etherlink 2 which is incredible because this isn't a real machine now it's going to plow through all those other commands to initialize a tcp ip networking stack off this floppy this is some like voodoo networking stuff <laughs> by the way i'm never going to understand all this now it's asking us for our username and password clab floppy is a user i set up on that windows 2000 machine which theoretically with the username and password are gonna give us access to the shares on that guy. It is jarring being so used to Linux that Windows just doesn't care about uppercase, lowercase. So we're gonna get logged in here. Now it's trying to map Z to our shared Windows directory and it succeeded. X to our machines directory with M1 in there. Hopefully this is M1 if we succeed here. And it says Clab Retro run setup now. We should be able to actually go to the Z directory. And if we do a dir, we should see the Windows 95 setup files. This is over the network. This machine machine does not have a hard drive. And then if we go to X, we can of course see the machine directories. Let's take a look at M1. Just make sure I get this right. MS batch. Okay, back to Z. We're gonna do setup IS. This is just going to tell setup to ignore the fact that we don't actually have a hard drive. And then we'll do x m1 msbatch.inf. We are running Windows 95 setup over the network. No hard drive involved. Let's see what happens here. This is probably good. This is really good. So a couple times I've ran this and this doesn't show up. The fact that setup recognizes it's running a server-based setup and the uh, smoking cap videos also, he calls it out that like, if you don't get here, you're not on the right track. So let's set up Windows to run from a network server. We want to start Windows from a floppy disk. This is the correct machine directory for the one we're setting up here. This is wild, 1995 folks, absolutely incredible. It sounds like we do want to do custom. Get our user information in here. I think you want to do no. The more it tries to automatically do, the more room for failure you have. So we're going to turn everything off based on the YouTube videos I've been watching. This is the furthest I've gotten, by the way. So we're in unknown territory. I'm going to go for broke and hope that I can get sound over this floppy booting Windows 95 install. This is a good sign. Don't want any of this. Uh, I don't know. Let's leave all this. We are not using client for Microsoft networks, which again, <laughs> might bite us in the ass here. We're just using Windows logon. So let's try that. M1 is fine. We're in a work group, not a domain. So I'm not going to push my luck or touch any of this. The drum, the drum is back, but only over the network this time. Presumably what's happening is all the necessary files from the shared Windows folder are being copied to the M1 directory. We'll see. It's a lot faster than a normal install because obviously it's uh, sharing a bunch of files. Okay, finally, we need to put a blank floppy disk in because obviously this uh, thin client Windows 95 machine is gonna boot off a floppy disk and it's gotta have some settings for how to like bootstrap itself. So let's see here. At least in 86 box, I'm gonna say new image. I'll name it Win95 M1 boot. Okay. So this should write to a virtual floppy disk. We'll see. This is where it gets a little sketchy because I'm doing this over an emulator and I haven't seen anyone that's done that before. Claims it's finished. Uh, let's take a look at the other Windows 95 VM. Here is our M1 folder now on the file share. And it obviously has a lot more stuff going on in it. That's a good, good sign. I'm going to eject our netboot disk and I'm gonna throw right in the disk that this setup utility just created. So what should happen ideally is we restart and this thing just knows how to behave. And based on the YouTube videos I've been watching, that's not what's gonna happen. 
Uh, so far, so good. <laughs> this is the floppy disk image that Setup just created that is theoretically specific to this machine. The worst thing that could happen when you're booting Windows 95 is the little animation at the bottom stops working and you just, you know, you're screwed. Okay, it dropped us back to this prompt. It knows about the Etherlink 2. It's complaining about NetBIOS. Uh, let's just say yes. I don't, I don't think it's going to work. It says, you will need to contact the system administrator. That's me. I was trying to give Microsoft the benefit of the doubt, but I kind of saw this coming because, you know, I was watching the Smoking Caps videos. And Setup basically makes an auto exec that's just not going to work on this floppy drive. So I'm on another Windows 95 VM. And we've loaded up the auto exec from the floppy drive we just made together over the netboot setup. And essentially this just isn't going to work. And I've got on the clipboard what should theoretically work. So we'll paste that in. I'm going to warn you right now. It kind of doesn't work. If we try to boot from this disk, of course, as before, we are getting the Windows 95 boot screen. It doesn't have trouble finding the 3Com adapter. Whenever I try to interact with a share or do a net logon, I get the workstation service is not started and IPX or NetBIOS must be running in order to load the network services. So something's wrong with this startup boot floppy configuration. Maybe I need to mess around in the settings when I'm laying that down during the setup. I went ahead and tried a different network card, a Novell 1000, and then I removed the dial-up adapters during the setup. Same issue, same exact problem. Then I tried again with the same card and I actually just added all the protocols it's complaining about. I think that worked. Oh man, this auto exec might be wrong. I haven't messed with it yet. Yeah, error occurred, okay. Wow, we are really, really close. It says we can't find this workstation in machines.any. I'll check that. It's definitely in there. I guess, I don't know why Windows would suddenly care about case. I don't think it matters, but I'll try that first. Uh, don't worry about this active desktop stuff. I'll show you that later. That didn't work. As you'll recall from our first attempt, I actually edited the auto exec from the boot disk that the setup installer made. I didn't do that this time just to see what it would do and it's not working. So I'm going to paste in what hopefully is a good configuration. Just a slightly different setup, setting up a temp directory flags to this set emder thing and then finally trying to get it to start Windows 95. Let's see where this gets us. Now we're cooking a little bit. The path to the registry file on the command line or in machines.ini is incorrect. Hmm. The only real difference I'm seeing other than file paths, of course, from other tutorials is this slash R on the snapshot command. So we're gonna remove that. If this works, we will consult the book. And I'll tell you what that thing's supposed to do even though I don't understand it. No luck. I don't know. I'm just kind of poking around. This network stack can view the M2 folder. I'm just not sure. One final shot. I'd been using X as the system data path letter here. I'm going to switch it to something else because I'm using it elsewhere, obviously, on the boot floppy. See what happens. This is the machines.any file. <laughs> no. <laughs> Didn't work. I've spent the better part of seven or eight evenings on this and I can't figure it out. I've tried tons of different configurations. Some I haven't even showed you. Nothing works. This is the furthest I've gotten though. So I think what I'm saying is this is going to be a two part video, but I don't want to leave you empty handed. It was really fun revisiting Windows 95. So let's look at some more Windows 95 stuff. Picture this. You're in seventh grade and you're in a typing class. They just got rid of the typewriters. It's all Windows 95 machines now. If you highlight the start button and you do alt minus, for some reason, you can close it. Let me tell you, that was a big hit. The teachers loved it. Another bonus for you. You may have been wondering, like, every time I open a folder, it opens a new window and so on and so on. And you might not remember this from Windows 95. Well, it's because IE4 hasn't been installed. We can, however, mount the IE4 installer. What a different time. So imagine this. I think I'm installing 
a new web browser. Windows Desktop Update. Yes, I would like that. That seems reasonable. Enhancements. I do love the spinning globe. There's something about this era of Microsoft UI. This is how big of a deal this was. Configuring system, like everything closes, the whole desktop shuts down. This just goes to show how integrated Explorer is, was, is, as IE transfers from three to four. And it's wrapped up. We have IE. Let's open this up. Yes, yes, I'm on a LAN. Here is IE4 on Windows 95, trying to load an ASP document from Microsoft.com here in 2024. Anyway, IE4, animation and all. And then we've got some ads, <laughs> of course. The WB, beautiful, love it, 1997. There's the Roadrunner. But all of that is very uninteresting compared to the general Explorer improvements. So earlier, I had all those windows clunking around, no toolbars or anything. This is essentially, despite what Microsoft would like you to believe, what a Windows 11 looks like. Like this is the UI. It's changed a little bit, of course, but more or less, got the up direction there. They got, they got this ribbon here. It's pretty fascinating to see how many UX paradigms were laid down about 30 years ago and Microsoft is uh, trying to dismantle them, but they're all relevant. Like I know exactly how to use this thing. So there's something to be said for that. Well, I hate to leave it like that, but I'm tired. I've spent a lot of time on this and it has been fun. It's actually the most fun was revisiting Windows 95, to be honest with you. I had a great time figuring out how to set that up in the VMs, hearing its startup noise over and over again, and just generally interacting with it. The plan here is I want to get some era appropriate hardware to actually try this on and just use Windows 95 in general. The main goal being to actually hook up some modems and dial up. And a massive thanks to a viewer named Corey who sent me this Hayes 1200 that you saw dialing up in the beginning of the video. And another shout out to the YouTube channel, The Smoking Cap. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere without the hard work that he clearly put in to figuring out what you need to do to get this going. Failure or not, I hope you enjoyed following along and I hope it inspires you to go try out older Windows versions. It's really fun to revisit them or experience them for the first time if you hadn't used them before. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing. And if you'd really like to support the channel, I'm on Patreon. I post behind the scenes type videos, exclusive content, little sneak peeks about what I'm up to, that sort of thing. Thank you so much for watching and I hope I see you in the next one.